Hey guys, Pickle Dragon back. Um, doing an early video. I know we said that we'd be doing these on the weekend, but um, here we are. I uh, my computer died, so I'm using a laptop with a with a bad keyboard. Um, managed to use the touchpad to navigate through everything and uh, get everything working. But um, so yeah, I had some questions that that came up. Uh, that uh, uh, I thought were interesting, so I thought we'd go ahead and do an early video. But um, in other news, though, and I posted about this at, on, in Instagram in my gaming world with the the big cabinet over here. Let's see, is got the bottom. There it is. All of the huge size miniatures have been. Have been inserted into the uh, into their new homes. Um, the bottom row are going to be contains all the the huge size miniatures, um, but they fit. There's a little bit of room left for some. I have some others in some overflow boxes that, that are going to need to go in there as well. But I have a feeling that the cabinet's not going to hold all the miniatures in the end. I think we're still going to have extra boxes. And, overflow boxes still because there's just too many but oh i guess it's, it's not a horrible place to be is it could always it could always be worse i could have fewer miniatures speaking of miniatures i did get you can't see my desk but there's just piles of miniatures on the desk because my wife was good enough to get me some new ones and i'll share a better picture of these tomorrow there's a big old iron golem i kind of like that's the piezo iron golem and I kind of like him because he has this old school look to him. Um, oh, an orc riding a rhinoceros. Can't can't go wrong with that, right? No way. Um, she got me this guy who looks like some sort of demon lady with a with a staff that has fire on both sides. Definitely can do something with that. Um, but I've got several others here. There's there's piles of them here that need to be sorted through. But the ones I'm really excited about, well, there's this mage. And he's got this, it looks like energy coming off of him. But I thought, what if he were like some sort of mage that was, was able to control slimes or oozes? And uh, so, yeah, I'm going to do something. It's another Paizo miniature. I'm going to do something a little different with him. But the miniatures I was really interested in are these. They're, again, Paizos. Um, they're called mites. And they look like little blue goblins. These, this one's riding a spider. And then this one is just on his own. Uh, but I, she got me like 20 of them. And I thought, hmm, we could do something with them. Like a, a variant on a goblin now. Obviously, Paizo's got their Mite monster, M-I-T-E. Um, but I, I plan to do something a little different with them. Something a little bit more um, up my alley, I think. But we'll, I'll talk about that later. So, some other stuff I picked up. Oops, I knocked into the camera. Uh, Redwood Scar from Dave Arneson's Blackmore. Of course, Blackmore... It's the first fantasy role playing setting, role playing game setting. Um, I'm interested. I'm anxious to pull out the old Blackmore books that I have, um, that are companions to that one. But those came out during the third edition days from Goodman Games, um, and it's it's pretty cool. I think being able to to see. Um, uh, the original setting, you know, a lot of people think of Greyhawk maybe as the original setting, but uh, from what I understand, Dave Arneson's Blackmore setting predates it, um, and I could be wrong. Someone could correct me on that if you want. It's just my understanding of it, uh, but it's still cool. I mean, we're talking about whether it's first or second. I mean, back when role playing was a brand new thing, and um, the idea of oh my god, I don't. This can be more than just a dungeon crawl. We can go out into the woods, 
we can go to the mountains. We can, you know, um, today we take all that for granted, you know. I think that's really cool how that, that discovery, um, that process that took place that, that led from war gaming to, okay, well, I can have a leader that leads my soldiers and, and, and then, well, what if I played the role of that leader? And then, you know, okay, well, let's take our leaders and make them adventurers. And, okay, so we're going to explore this dungeon. Well, what's outside the dungeon? You know, and it just goes on and on and on. And it has this natural progression to it. I think that's really cool. That's really cool. But, <clears throat> uh, you know, another gaming news I heard that Brian Bloom passed away. And for those of you who don't know who he is, he was one of the founders of TSR with Gary Gygax. And there was a, there's a lot of controversy that surrounds the Blooms. You know, some people some people don't like them because of the uh, tension between the Gygaxes and the Blooms. And um, not, not at the family level, but, you know, at the professional level. Um, but, you know, it's always sad to see someone pass away. So, and he was responsible for a lot of really good... Boot Hill, one of my favorite role-playing games. Um, he co-authored Boot Hill. I think he had some, a hand in um, the Marvel games as well, Marvel superheroes, which I played a lot of as a kid. So it's, it's sad to see, you know, someone that, that was responsible for those uh, really creative person um no uh -oh, the dogs are getting worked up um <clears throat> pass away like that regardless of what happened back in the day you know so you know that's kind of what's going on in my gaming world right now but i do i did have a question from somebody they they had asked me um <clears throat> how I felt about grid maps versus theater of the mind. And to me, um, theater of the mind should be used just as much as maps. You know, a lot of wandering monsters, wandering encounters, you want them, you want to keep players on their toes, but they're not necessarily, you know, very interesting encounters unless there's some sort of trap or an ambush. You know, two, two parties just kind of coming and, you know, coming across one another. They're likely not very precarious terrain. There's not a lot, any, you know, not much in the way of, uh, of special hazards that need to be considered in the battlefield. So in the interest of keeping the game moving, you're like, okay, well, um, you know, you've encountered this group of bandits and they're just as surprised you are. You know, what do you do? Um, versus, you know, you're fighting on the side of a mountain and you've got to be able to track, you know, every step a player takes and they may have to make rolls and or slip and fall. And um, I like to use the grid map when there's a lot of terrain that will impact the battle, you know, um, or a, a complicated monster to fight. You know, like a roper has all of its tendrils that are going to feel its way out. And, and of course, you know, underground, you might have cover behind stalagmites and um, rock formations and so forth. So that might be a little bit more complicated. Uh, but basically, anything, you got, you got to, you got to balance the two, you know, anything that will keep the, that will slow the game down. But in an uninteresting way, use theater of the mind to speed through it and just use descriptions to make it interesting. Um, and then grid maps and miniatures and so forth are great when you have a really complicated scenario of a battle with a lot of um, moving parts. You know, maybe you could have a volcanic area where if a party member slips and they might fall into a lava, you know, like you need to track all those bits and pieces. Uh, but, you know, they both have their place. So as long as it doesn't slow down your game and everyone's having fun, that's what matters, you know. Um, I know people to this day that still only use theater of the mind, which is great, you know, and their players are fun, have fun doing it. And of course, I use a lot of miniatures, 
Um, but we do a lot of theater of the mind too. So there's that. Now the, the, the other question I had was my favorite memory of D and D, and I, I have so many favorite ones, but there was one just the other day I was thinking about, and um, I don't know why this came, why this popped in my head, but you know, one of the one of the uh, and bear with me, this is a little bit along of a story, but one of the best things a DM can do is evoke emotion. Typically, a game during games, a lot of that emotion is humor. You know, we laugh and have a good time and poke fun at each other when we make mistakes, um, act silly. You know, uh, but when a DM can, when a DM can um, bring out, you know, fear, sorrow, um, exuberance, triumph. That feeling of triumph, you know. There's, I've seen people all leaning over the table, and there's a, they're a die roll away from triumph or disaster, and they hit that natural twenty, and it, the table just erupts, you know. Um, but evoking emotion, sometimes, sometimes, and in this case, in this story's case, it uh, it it was unexpected the reaction. Um, but they, the party, this was boy, back in the eighties, the party was, was fighting a necromancer and he's obviously a very intelligent spellcaster. Um, and he, the party had been a thorn in his side for a while, but they hadn't, they hadn't done any real damage to his plans. So he, he kind of anticipated that they, that they could. So he wanted to learn more about them. So during the course of a fight, <clears throat> he had the opportunity to capture a party member. He had his thugs, his henchmen, capture a party member and then run off with them in the middle of the fight. Um, so essentially that party member, that player, was forced to play, either make a new character or play NPCs. Well, they chose, well, I want to I wanna play an NPC until we can mount a rescue. Um, so while the party was trying to figure out where their paladin, this was a paladin, was taken, a second edition paladin, um, well, there was it second edition. This was in the late eighties. It possibly was second edition. Yeah. Um, or no, maybe it was first edition. I can't remember right now, but I remember the story. So, um, while they were trying to figure out where the, the party or the paladin was taken, I called I called her up and I said, listen, if you want to role play this, we can. And so in those days, you know, didn't have email or anything. So we did it by correspondence. We, we wrote and wrote and luckily we worked together. So, you know, I would prepare a draft and hand it to her. And then the next day she would bring me her draft for all work. And, um, she was taken to the necromancer's tower and thrown in a cell and she was human. So it was complete darkness. She knew that neighboring her was an older man who'd been imprisoned there for quite some time. And periodically, uh, an orcish torturer would come for her and, um, would try to get information about the party out of her, you know, beat her up and whatnot. Um, do all the evil things, you know, and eventually a child was placed in the cell with the paladin. The child was terrified, never spoke, and it got to the point where they were taking her, the paladin, away to, to try to, you know, extract information, and she would eventually pass out from the from the rigors of the in interrogations and would wake up back in her cell again in, in pitch black. And eventually the party figured out, oh, we've, we found the, this necromancer's tower. And they mounted a rescue. And of course, by this point, um, 
She hated that orca's torture with a passion. She never saw the necromancer, but she hated that orca's torture. Um, and 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 by by extension, she her her anger towards the necromancer grew as well. But she never broke. She never gave up information on the on the uh, the the uh, on the party or what they were doing to stop the necromancer's plans. So <clears throat> eventually, when the party broke into the tower, into the dungeons of the tower, they raced and and they were horrified to see that their paladin was undead, just a skeletal figure. The little child. There's a little girl in the prison with her. Um, of course, by this time, there had been a lot of role play between the two, and so there was a lot of affection between the child and the paladin, um, and we're talking a couple weeks of daily interactions between the two of us, so she had kind of grown attached to the child. The child still hadn't spoken, though, and so the paladin was like, all right, first we're going to get this orc. And of course they did. They burst into the torture chamber and they they beat the hell out of the orc and took him prisoner. Um, at this point, they didn't want to kill him because they wanted to know what he knew of the Necromancer. Well, then they learned the Necromancer was still in the tower, so they stormed up to the top of the tower. Necromancer's at the top, kind of laughing, smirking at her. And um, In those days, there was a thing called... Um, a skeletal knight and their soul would be trapped in usually something like it. it could be any vessel but it was usually a magical circlet for their soul and they they would remain undead till that circle was destroyed and it would free them from their undead curse but it didn't necessarily have to be a circlet so when she came and she confronted the, the necromancer he didn't even really fight back she grabbed him she said she punched him and you know you know, what did you do to me? You know, how do you, how do we undo this? And he said, well, um, the key to your salvation has been with you all along. And she realized in order to, the thing she needed to destroy, the thing that the necromancer had essentially placed her soul into, which I believe is the way it worked, was the little girl next to her that she'd been, that she had been, um, imprisoned with for these these weeks and sh and this was the moment i was not prepared for because the pal the player just burst into tears and she's like i can't do that you know and she was literally she was she was upset with me and i'm like you know i was younger at the time so i don't know if looking back if i would have done it that way probably not that was pretty vicious but eventually the paladin just chose to stay undead and to make a new character rather than do something with that little girl. And uh, so that's that's one of the stories I've been thinking about recently. But it, but the great the 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 thing that was great about it if if there was anything that was great about it was the the level of hatred they had for that evil necromancer, one of the big bad evil guys of the campaign is I mean, they genuinely had some hatred for that character, for that for that villain, and that's something that is that is gold to a DM. You know, you can't can't put a price on that um, because your players are are vested in defeating him. You know, they are, they they uh, there's no joking around. There is no um, you know goofing around at the table when when that guy makes an appearance and it's that is gold but i have some other great stories i'll share with you sometime um that one i don't know if it's a great story it's a memory but uh um it was a tough one though and of course i'm not i'm not telling you guys all all of the details because it's been a while but that was the gist of it so but I hope you enjoy. Um, I'm always anxious to hear more questions from you guys. I have a ton already, but always looking for more. Um, I've got uh, uh, some other things to share. I got my Gary Con loot. Some of my Gary Con looted, but I'll 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 put that in a video later this week. Keep this one um, 
keep this one as short as possible, but in the meantime, happy gaming, friends, and uh, please be heroic to one another.